Many people love the hymn, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. Even non-Christians like it. In 1970, Judy Collins released it as a single and it got to number five in the charts. But it's not a pop song, it's a hymn. It's meant to be sung to God in, in worship. It's a hymn about grace and it's a hymn about how amazing the grace of God is. But as I've prayed and as I've spoken about this evening already, I sometimes wonder, how amazed by grace are we? How amazed by grace are we? Or have we become used to grace? Have we become familiar with God's grace? Are we perhaps beginning just to take it a little bit for granted? Well, tonight, as we come to Genesis 31, as we continue to learn these lessons from, from the life of Jacob, I want us to catch hold of, of the glimpses of God's grace, which are on display here in this passage. I want us to see God's grace at work. And it is my hope and my prayer that as we, we touch on these themes of God's grace at work in the life of Jacob, that you and I, that we'll be thrilled, that we'll be filled with wonder, that we will be amazed again by God's grace. So my title this evening then is, is Seeing Grace at Work. Seeing Grace at Work. And of course we need to begin, don't we, if we're seeing grace at work with, with saving grace. That's where we have to start, God's saving grace. I'm sure you don't need me to tell you this, but Jacob was a believer. Jacob was saved. In Hebrews 11, he, we read of, of his faith. He set before us as an example of faith. Jacob will be in the new heavens and the new earth with us for all eternity. He was saved. And salvation always comes by the grace of God. But what is this grace that we're talking about? What is grace? It's a word we use a lot. It's a word that fills our hymns. It's a word that fills our sermons and our prayers. But what do we mean by it? What is grace? Well, grace is an essential part of God's character. It's closely related to his goodness, to his love, to his mercy. Simply put, it is it is God giving us the exact opposite of what we deserve. We deserve one thing from him, but he gives us the exact opposite. That is grace. And to fully understand that, we, we need to think about who we are without the Lord Jesus Christ. And then who we become by God's grace in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's think about what we deserve and what the opposite of what we deserve that we get from God actually is so what are we without Jesus Christ well, without Jesus Christ you and I we're condemned sinners we are guilty of rebellion against God's will we are deserving of hell and judgment naturally speaking we have no relationship with God we have no right to call him father he is our judge we are deserving of that judgment deserving of death because we are unrighteous. We have no means of saving ourselves. We are dead in our sin. We are blinded by it. That's what we are without Jesus Christ. But in the Lord Jesus Christ, we're justified. We are declared righteous. We are forgiven. We are given a, a new life. We have a, a new sight. We're, we're adopted into God's family. We now call him father, not judge. But Father, this is grace. Getting the exact opposite of what we deserve from God. It's all his unmerited favour. How is this possible? How can a holy and a just God uh, bring us into his family, declare us righteous, forgive us for our sin? Well, that's a question that, that brings us right to the heart of the gospel. That's a question that, that takes us to the foot of the cross, that brings us back to that communion table that we met around this morning, because it, it takes our eyes to look upon the Lord Jesus Christ as he hangs upon Calvary's cross and as he dies in our place. 
You see, there upon that cross, God's anger, his wrath, his justice, meet his love. He pours out all of that wrath, all of that anger at our sin upon his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So his justice is completely satisfied. And he's able to to throw the door of his love wide open and, and pour out all of his goodness, all of his kindness on us. He's able to save us. Consider Romans 5 verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's grace. That is is grace. And the grace that saves is also the grace that keeps. It guides us. It provides for us. It protects us. And it is completely reliable. And that's what we're going to see as we as we step through uh, Genesis 31 this evening. We're going to see this amazing grace of God that guides, that provides and that protects. And you see, there's, there's a lot more going on here than this just being a story of how Jacob finally manages to escape Laban and return home. A deeper look reveals... Uh, little sparkles of God's grace shining through in Jacob's uh, situation here. So what do, what do those sparkles of grace look like? Well, this brings me to my second point. I want to talk about guiding grace, guiding grace. Remember, uh, from the moment uh, Jacob was leaving his homeland, the promised land, God had promised him that he would bring him back to that land, that he would bring him back to Canaan. We saw last time that that Jacob has stepped out in faith that God will bring him back. He's asked for permission to to return home. But that was was six years before. So although the the door has begun to open, the the final opportunity to actually take that step of faith has has not yet happened. Jacob's relationship, as as we look at the opening verses of this chapter, his relationships with Laban's family are are getting worse. His sons resent Jacob and his wealth, verse 1. Laban's attitude is worsening as well, verse 2. But Jacob is is still there. Having taken that step of faith, having asked for permission to, to go home, he's still waiting patiently on God uh, to keep his promise. He stepped out in faith. Now he's waiting on the Lord. But as we come to to verse three, we see that his faith, his patience, they're rewarded by God. Then the Lord said to Jacob, return to the land of your fathers and to your family, and I will be with you. God never forgets a promise that he makes, and he never fails to keep a promise that he's made either. He promised to bring Jacob home, Genesis 28, verse 15, 20 years later, he says to Jacob, now's the time, go home. I will be with you. I will keep you. I will protect you. God's guiding grace. But how does God's guiding grace come to us? Well, certainly uh, circumstances played their part for Jacob. The worst in relationship with Laban and with his sons, that that plays a part for Jacob leaving. But Jacob says that, doesn't he, to Leah and Rachel when he calls them to himself. God is sovereign and so he controls our circumstances and he can use our circumstances to guide us, to guide our steps. But notice that circumstances on their own are not enough for Jacob. Despite the worsening situation, he doesn't actually act until God speaks. Uh, Read with me again from verse 3. Then the Lord said to Jacob, return to the land of your fathers and to your family and I will be with you. So Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah to the field to his flock. Notice that word there. So what prompts Jacob's actions? It's not the worsening relationship with Laban and and Laban's sons. No, it's God's word. When God spoke, Jacob acted. 
We need to make sure that, that this is a truth which is settled deep in our minds and in our hearts. God guides through his word. God's gracious guidance comes to us today through his word. Your situation, yes, that might have a part to play. Your feelings may even have a part to play. We have to be careful of them as we were thinking about this morning. Uh, Jeremiah 17 verse 9 reminds us, doesn't it, that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Circumstances, feelings, they have a part to play, but primarily God's guidance comes through his word. In his goodness, in his grace, he has given us the Bible, this, this library of books, and it is full of, of his guidance. If you want to know what God wants from you in any particular situation, you'll find it here in this book. Through your careful, prayerful reading of God's word, you will find what God wants from you. Psalm 119, verse 105, we know it so well. This is what it's telling us, isn't it? Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Now, before we move on to see, to see more of God's grace in action, I just want to touch on, on another verse about guidance. This is Romans 8, verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. This is the, the promise of, of guiding grace. Maybe, maybe guidance is something that you're particularly anxious about. Maybe you're often concerned, well, well am I in the perfect will of God? And sometimes this, this anxious, this, sorry, this anxiety for to be in the perfect will of God, it, it actually paralyzes us. We stop and we won't do anything unless we know exactly what it is that God wants from us. We expect a big finger to come down and point saying, do this. I knew, a, I knew a young man once, he, he had fantastic preaching gifts, but he wouldn't step out in faith and, and commit to training uh, for the ministry. He wouldn't even commit to being a lay preacher. Why? Because he wasn't sure that was what God was calling him to do. He was waiting for a sign. He had all the gifts. He had all the opportunities. He had the instruction of God's word that we had to proclaim the gospel. But he was waiting for more. My friends, Paul promises us, he assures us that God's guidance is actually part and parcel of being God's child. If you are saved, he is guiding your life 24-7. In fact, he guides our lives and directs our paths far more than we realise. So in the words of Kevin De Young, we really can just do something. When God puts you in a situation, respond as his word tells you to respond. Act as scripture guides you. And know with absolute certainty you are in God's will. His guiding grace is upon your life. Thirdly then, moving on, God's hidden grace. God's hidden grace. God's grace isn't, isn't always obvious. It's powerful, but sometimes it's quiet. Often it's, it's unseen. God is doing things behind the scenes that, that actually we know nothing about. Grace can, can be hidden. And, and actually we see that here in, in Jacob's escape from Laban. God has spoken to Jacob, telling him it, it's time to go. Jacob gathers his wives to him in the field. He, he explains the situation. He details the worsening relationship with Laban and the family. He talks about Laban's continual manipulation and, and deception. But what I want to do is, is draw your attention to, to Jacob's testimony of God's hidden grace at work. Because what we actually see here is, is God taking the veil away so that Jacob actually knows what God is doing behind the scenes. It's there in verses 11 to 13. We've got this, this awful situation. Laban is, is taking advantage of Jacob. He's, he's walking all over Jacob. And from the outside looking in, you, you may wonder, well, well, why is God allowing that? Why is God allowing Jacob to be treated this way by Laban? It might be a situation that, that you're familiar with in your own life. Wonder why is God allowing this to happen? Why is God treating me 
like this. What, what is he doing? Well, as I say, uh, as we look at this, we, we see that, that God just gives Jacob a little insight into what is actually going on, that his hidden grace is there at work. Read with me from verse 11. Uh, This is Jacob speaking. Then the angel of the Lord spoke to me in a dream saying, Jacob, and I said, here I am. And he said, lift your eyes now and see for all the rams which leap on the flocks are streaked, speckled and gray spotted. For I have seen all that Laban is doing to you. I am the God of Bethel where you anointed the pillar and where you made the vow to me. Now arise, get out of this land, return to the land of your family. Didn't matter what Laban did. Didn't matter how Laban tried to prevent Uh, Jacob from getting that fair wage that they'd agreed. Everything Laban did, God made sure behind the scenes that Jacob was blessed. It was the speckled, the streaked, the spotted goats and sheep that were born. God was making Jacob rich. God was providing. Those animals, that they, they didn't abound because of Jacob's herding techniques that we were thinking, breeding techniques that we were thinking about last week. No, they abounded because God was there doing his work behind the scenes, providing for him. God's grace might not always be obvious, but God's grace is always at work. It's always at work. In truth, uh, God might not draw back the curtain for, for us at all, like he did for Jacob. But just because you can't see what God is doing doesn't mean that he isn't doing anything. Just because you don't understand his purposes, it doesn't mean that they aren't good and right for you. You could think about uh, Joseph, Jacob's son. As his brothers sell him into slavery, as he's falsely accused in the home of Potiphar, as he's thrown into jail and left to rot there by people who promised to help him. Do you think he always understood and saw God's purpose? I don't know, maybe he did. But whether he did or he didn't, it makes no difference. God was still at work in all of those horrible things he was going through. What his brothers meant for evil, God meant for good. And in hindsight, later on, he certainly knows that's the case because he testifies to it. God's grace is often hidden. We might get glimpses in our own lives, like we see in the life of Jacob. But just because you can't see God at work in his great love, and his great goodness, in his amazing grace as he provides for you, doesn't mean he isn't working. All it means is that his grace is is hidden. It isn't obvious. Well, let's, let's move on. Protecting grace, protecting grace. Jacob, Jacob leaves. He does what God has said. He leaves. So clearly he's trusting God and he's obeying God. But it doesn't seem that his trust is complete and total. Now look at verse 20. Jacob stole away unknown to Laban the Syrian in that he did not tell him that he intended to flee. He actually leaves whilst Laban's away shearing his sheep. It's perhaps surprising in some way. He's trusted God for these 20 years to overrule in his relationship with Laban. He's testified to how God has done that. But now, as as he admits to Laban in verse 31, his fear of Laban has suddenly got the better of him. And so he, he goes in secret. There's faith here. He's obeying God. He is setting off home. But there's a weakness here as well rather than a strength. He, he sneaks off. His faith isn't, isn't so strong at this point. And, and perhaps, yes, we, we could say, well, his faith should have been stronger. He should. He didn't have to do that. But instead, what I'd like to do is, is look at this positively this evening. I'd like us to see that, that this is faith. And as the Lord Jesus Christ reminds us, only a little faith is It's all that we need. In Matthew 17, verse 20, he says, If you have faith as a mustard seed, you shall say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Faith is faith. God, great. God's grace protects his faithful people. And God, in his grace, deals with us 
in our weakness. Here is struggling, fearful Jacob. So what does God do? God gives him an opportunity to sneak away. God gives him this three-day window to, to get away and get a head start on Laban. Of course, as, as soon as Laban finds out, Laban sets off in pursuit, verse 23. Then he took his brethren with him and pursued him for seven days' journey and overtook him in the mountains of Gilead. We'll never know Laban's true intentions as he does that. <coughs> Why did he chase after Jacob in that way? We don't know. but We can be fairly certain they were not good. Laban never intended Jacob uh, to keep those flocks and the wealth that he'd accumulated. He perhaps never intended Jacob to be able to, to take his family away either. But whatever Laban's plans were, they have to change because of God's protecting grace. God intervenes. Look at verse 24. But God had come to Laban the Syrian in a dream by night and said to him, be careful that you speak to Jacob, neither good nor bad. And so uh, we are flying through this passage this evening, I know, uh, but I'm just wanting to bring out these, these sparkles of grace. God protecting Jacob. We see, we see, don't we, when, when Laban finally confronts Jacob, that he, he gives these rather feeble reasons for his hot-headed pursuit with, with all of his men. You didn't give me a chance to say goodbye to my daughters, uh, verses 26 and also verse 28. I would have thrown you a party if I'd known, verse 27. I could hurt you, but God's told me not to, verse 29. And then verse 30, you've stolen my gods, my household idols. It's an accusation Jacob actually denies because he doesn't know what Rachel has done. Laban doesn't find those idols in his search. Now, the idols and Rachel's ability to match her father's uh, cunning, those are not things I want to explore with you uh, tonight. As I say, my, my focus here is upon God protecting Jacob. This is the point. This encounter, it could have led to, to his death. Very least, it was likely to lead to him being robbed of all his property and perhaps his family as well. That's, that's, that's most likely what Laban intended, but it ends very differently. It ends with Laban and Jacob going their separate ways and, and making this promise uh, to, to stay apart from each other, never to, to cross this, this one point with any intention to harm the other. This is God's protecting grace. Laban had meant to harm Jacob, but God prevented it. God stopped him. Even in Jacob's doubt and fear, God protected him. And, and that brings me to, to the last one I want us to think about tonight. This is God's reliable grace. God's reliable, <coughs> excuse me, excuse me, God's reliable grace. Jacob struggled with grace. He always had he had, he had a natural inclination not to trust God, but to take matters into his own hands, to do things his, his own way. And though he was learning, though he was certainly growing in faith, his faith wasn't always complete. His faith wasn't always strong. If he'd truly been convinced of the grace of God, he wouldn't have had to sneak away when Laban's back was turned. And Jacob, well, we'll see in the very next chapter next Sunday that, that he has the same trouble again when faced with, with Esau as Esau approaches him with these 400 men. And, and we'll look at that next time from, from perhaps Jacob's perspective. Whereas this evening, I want us to think about this more from, from God's perspective. But before we get there, let's just remind ourselves that, that we're exactly the same. We're exactly the same. We, we trust God. We take God at his word. Of course we do. But is our faith always strong? Is it always complete? It certainly should be. There's no reason for it ever not to be. But the truth is we struggle just as much as Jacob struggled. We can lie awake at night with worry. We grow anxious for the future. We get angry. We get cross. We take matters in, into our own hands. And as I say, we'll, we'll think about this struggle from the human perspective more, more next time. 
But the thing I want to, to really drive home tonight, because what we're thinking about is God's grace in our lives. As we've considered God's saving work, his, his guiding work, his providing work, and his protecting work, we thought of them all in terms of grace, of God giving us the opposite of what we deserve, because that's what they are. Every step of the way, this is God's gracious work. And grace, well, grace is grace. It is unmerited. It is unearned. It's all of God and it's, and it's nothing of us. What we've seen from the life of Jacob, I think makes that clear to us again this evening. Even when Jacob doubted, even when Jacob feared, God's grace was still there at work, reaching him in the situation he was in. And this is the point about grace which truly amazes us, surely. Grace is all of God. It's all of God. Our doubts, our fears, our, our weaknesses, they don't negate God's grace. They don't weaken it towards us at all. Yes, God works with the faith of his people. Of course he does. He does great things in response to the faith of his people. But he doesn't need our faith. He doesn't need it. He doesn't rely on our faith to do his great works. Not at all. Actually, his grace, his grace that saves, it comes to us in the gospel before we even have any faith at all in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in grace that, that God awakens that faith in us in the first place. Ephesians 2 verse 8 that makes this so clear. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. And this will remain the case throughout our lives. God's grace is reliable. Even when you're filled with doubts, even when you're filled with fears, even when you're struggling in every way imaginable, God's grace is there. His saving grace, his guiding grace, his providing grace, his, his protecting grace. And the truth is, uh, as Paul discovers in his own life, the more we acknowledge our weakness, the more we depend upon that grace, the more we see its strength shining through in our lives. Remember what the Lord Jesus Christ said to Paul as, as he struggles with that thorn in his flesh? 2 Corinthians 12 verse 9. My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. The devil, this world, they've never brought a Christian to their grave before the time God has appointed. And they never will, because God's grace is reliable. The devil's schemes, the world's temptations, our own weakness, our own sin, our own struggles, our own fears. They can't keep us from entering the gates of heaven, because God's grace is utterly reliable for the child of God. This is how amazing God's grace is. The question for us tonight is, will we embrace God's amazing grace? Will we fall into his loving arms? Will we rely on him? Oh, tonight your faith might be tiny. You might, it might be surrounded by massive doubts and, and tremendous fears. <coughs> but still, God's <coughs> grace it's all of him. It's not about you. Your fears, your anxieties, your concerns, your doubts. When it comes to God's grace, they don't matter. Cast yourself on him like Jacob did. Learn with Paul that God's grace is sufficient for you. Stand at the foot of the cross See how God has made this amazing grace available to you in the suffering of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And be thrilled. Be amazed by the grace of God. Amen.